Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Renzo Martins. Thank you for inviting me at um, this uh, conference on dissent and discipline. Um, I'm an artist. I also run a an institute in Congo on a former Unilever plantation. Unilever is a huge company that produces shampoo and soap. It has, it makes five billion dollars in profit per year. Um, on one of them, their plantations in Congo, I'm building this art center. I'll talk about it later. Um, now, I think I should talk a little bit on, about the, the nature of what I think, let's say, dissent and discipline is. I also want to talk about adding feelings to the status quo that we inhabit, about decolonization, it was already a subject earlier on, and about progressive and inclusive politics, basically about what we all do here. And I want to talk about a very unique moment in history that has finally arrived. But let me start about with the, the attempts, let's say the critical claims of contemporary art about decolonizing the museum or the documenta moving to Athens, clearly uh, attempts to somehow reflect upon changing changing labor conditions, changing economic structures that we inhabit, not only reflect, reflect on them, but also really intervene within this status quo that we inhabit. Um, it's all very good, of course. I love these political claims of art, the fact that we're all talking about inclusivity, and, and we will certainly for the next days. But on the other hand, we all know that this conference and Documenta and the Internationale, Galit Eilat is here, I think, She's part of it, the Internationale, this conglomerate of, I think, five or six European museums with the most fascinating program uh, on decolonizing the museum. Uh, we all know that it's paid for by global economic inequality. Um, just as a tiny example, I will fly back in a few days to Amsterdam, which has the biggest cocoa port in the world. Uh, uh, Millions upon millions of kilograms of cocoa are stacked in pristine, clean warehouses kept at a constant temperature of 18 degrees Celsius. Um, extremely clean, whereas on the plantations, all the kids have malaria. The electricity we use it, as I researched yesterday, comes at least partially from uranium mines in Botswana, where the average income is $2 per month. So our claims, however good it is to talk about them, it's really useful to put them in a more global perspective and maybe go a little bit deeper in who pays the costs of nice conferences like these. For example, in the chocolate in industry, I mentioned it, Amsterdam, where I partially live, is the biggest cocoa port in the world. Um, it is people in Congo, in Ghana, in Mexico, in Colombia do the physical labor. They work on these plantations, obviously make little money. Um, then the cocoa is shipped by, with boats to Amsterdam. It's processed, it's made into chocolate bars. And then agencies, um, publicity agencies, add feelings and emotions and ideas to the chocolate, like this bar of chocolate, it makes you really happy, or you'll you know, seduce your lover, or maybe it will create nice moments in your family for Christmas time, things like that. So people in Congo, uh, in, in, in Ghana, in uh, Ivory Coast, do the labor, and then feelings are added, and critical thoughts are added uh, by these agencies in Amsterdam, New York, uh, London, etc. Um, in the arts, I think it's really very similar. We look at all this and then we add feelings and critical thoughts to that. To global inequality, to labor conditions, to the status quo that we inhabit. So people elsewhere do the labor and we add feelings and emotions and criticality to it. 
And, you, for example, you can go to Venice. The last biennial was very much about global inequality and a sort of Marxist revival. You can go to Venice if you have enough money to pay for the ticket and the entrance fee and, uh, and the hotels, and then you can learn about global inequality. And this also is a nice, clean space. So, funnily enough, artistic engagement with global inequality, with all the huge challenges that the world is facing, takes place only in the very rich places within that inequality. Here are the rich people, here are the poor people. We reflect upon it, but only the people here are we. We reflect on all it. Hardly ever a conference like this takes place in, I don't know, a mining town in, 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 in Botswana. I think the Swedish Public Art Agency should organize one in a uranium mining town in Botswana. If you don't, this conference is completely sterile, I would even argue useless. I mean it. It's not a joke. Maybe it's morally wrong to have this conference only here, but more importantly, it is sterile. Whatever critique will be created here is sterile in advance. You cannot look on to gl global inequality, climate change, uh, uh, capital accumulation for the 1% if only the people who inhabit the nice part of that equation have the right to argue about it, to think about it, have the time and space to process it. It only would work, it only could have some relevance if the people on the other side of that equation would be equally part of it. I am Dutch, and so in many ways that is a Nordic country, like Sweden also is a Nordic country, with a welfare state, with cultural, culturally liberal politics. You know, we can, I'm sure marijuana is legal, uh, you can be a homosexual, uh, you can, you know, um, whatever, all these culturally liberal things. We also have time and space and money for critical art. And yet, I know of my country, the Netherlands, that it is an, an essential part of empire. Um, it's a tax haven for Google, for Amazon, for Starbucks. Um, we provide the NSA with all the information they need. The big hub to ship all the data to the NSA is in Amsterdam. Um, and so, even if our Politics on, it, on this surface, surface level are liberal. And I think this, I, I, I'm sorry to say it, but this is part of that surface, surface level, level of liberal politics. Even if on the surface level we're part of you know, a more liberal, open, transparent, inclusive society, we are an essential part of global imperialism, empire. And it's essential even for art funding. If I talk again for the Netherlands, um, our businesses, Dutch businesses, uh, depend completely for support on American military support. Shell, Philips, Heineken, and Unilever, the company I just mentioned. And I'm sure the same is true for Volvo and, uh, and, and Ikea and H&M. It depends on being part of a certain club. And the club requires you to play the game tax havens, etc. So, the claims that we can make here are really, I think we should be, could be so much more radical if we would understand all of this, I'm sure we do, and then take action, really deal with it. So now I want to show this video of a person who works on his Unilever plantation in Congo. Bon, je dis que c'est moi, il n'y a pas de sarre. Pour toucher le serment, il n'a rien. Tu gagnes combien Tu gagnes combien Tu gagnes combien Tu touches combien Je veux cette décan. Ah oui.
Les gardez moi ici, un travailleur pour moi. Il n'a que le faute de, de travailler chez moi. On peut entrer On peut entrer. Regardez-moi. C'est capté. Vous travaillez pour la compagnie depuis longtemps, beaucoup des années. Bon, ils y sont que 25 ans. 25 ans Oui. Et l'huile de palme, ça va où L'huile, ma foute, hein, à Kaïwapi Bon, il n'est pas touché. Ça, c'est notre habitat de paye. On est à payer. Voilà, on est à payer. Total de retenue, voilà. 38, 38 000. 397 moins total de retenue 11 735 et le reste en ATP 19 261. Ça c'est pour combien de jours 26 jours. Non, ce n'est pas pour 26 jours. Oui, c'est 26 jours. C'est 26 jours. On s'en lève droit. Avec ça, on sait acheter beaucoup de nourriture Non, non, ça, ça ne suffit pas. Ça ne suffit pas. Le paquet de poisson coûte à 2500, 2000. Hein? Paquet de chicoang, 300 francs. Alors, pour un mois, il va consommer combien Alors, ça ne suffit pas. Trop insuffisant. Et avant, c'était pour unir le verre. Et actuellement, ce. Unir le verre, ils ont quitté quand Unir le verre, c'est à peine. Hein? C'est à peine qu'ils viennent de nous quitter. Euh, depuis. 2018, je pense. Et nous traitons actuellement, c'est Ferroni qui nous, qui nous a pris. Nous sommes maintenant sur Ferroni. Avec Unilever, c'était mieux C'était la même chose. C'était la même chose. Lundi, vous travaillez aussi et mardi Mardi, oui, il oui, travaillait. Parce qu'il y aura un, une, une conférence, vous êtes invité. C'est moi. Oui, vous pouvez venir. Conférence, hein, conférence, c'est ça. Mais vous allez inviter. La oui. conférence, Yohana. Oui. Yo, vous allez inviter la conférence. Ok. Alors, à quoi nous sommes Bon, c'est la date. Conférence. C'est mardi. Mardi, oui, oui, mardi prochain. Oui. So what is he going to talk about at this conference that I organize with many other people on the plantation? What does decolonizing mean if it's about words, about representation? We could decolonize this film, maybe. You know, he looks up to me a little bit, so maybe he has a, a, a lower position because I'm taller than he is. So maybe... In decolonizing in the art artistic sphere, the, the way I understand it, it would be like giving him a little wooden pedestal so he can look at me evenly. Then the image would look better. And we would think, oh, that's an inclusive film, whereas now maybe you think, oh, it's you know, unequal. But of course, the underlying structures are what really matters. And the underlying structure is that he has no time, no energy, no brain power, because his brain is very concerned with feeding his children tonight, to ever, ever think about any of these issues that we will discuss here. And we depend on his labor. So, <laughs> I feel I'm really angry. <laughs> uh, I organized this conference that
that was he partook in the first one. We did a second one just a few months ago, September. Uh, it was called a matter of critique, the material economic conditions for articulating critique. And one of the main guests was Professor Sikitele. He's a Congolese professor at the University of Kinshasa. And he spoke about the revolt of the Bapende. The Bapende was one of the people inhabiting the region where Unilever started its plantations in 1911. And the plantations functioned mostly on unpaid forced labor. And the Bapende were very good at climbing in trees and getting the palm oil out. So they had a huge load of unpaid labor to do. In 1931, there was a big revolt, the revolt of the Bapende. If you went to school in Belgium, the way I did as a child, you learn about this as an ethnic uprising. And they slaughtered some uh, white colonial agents. But of course, the revolt was against forced labor. And it becomes... So 4,000 of these Bapende, the entire leadership, and all the artists were uh, either jailed or killed. Many of them were killed. And most importantly, I guess, was that sculpture and art production was forbidden by then. They had to work on the plantations, but through some schemes, including Catholic missionaries and Protestant missionaries, including many Swedish, uh, art production was forbidden, which is amazing, because by then... 1931, ethnographic museums all over Europe and the United States had stockpiled Bapende masks and artifacts. They became very famous and they inspired the entire European avant-garde, uh, including Picasso and Matisse and the Blaue Reiter, in, in, uh, etc. So they, they were hugely influential in developing the art realm that we now still inhabit, modernism, let's say. Now, so they were forbidden to do that, right? They, still, they could just work on the plantation, and that was it. Uh, whereas here, it was so inspirational, their work. When I started the Institute for Human Activities on this very location uh, in 2012, the irony is just complete. Uh, people still worked for Unilever, because even if the company had been sold in 2009 or 10, as they just explained us, production still is just for Unilever, but it's another company taking care of business. It's still Unilever products. And Unilever by then had funded for 10 or 12 years the Unilever series in Tate Modern in London, in the Turbine Hall, one of the biggest events of the art calendar worldwide, which made Tate Modern into... I guess the most visible art museum in the world, the best visited art museum in the world, and of course rebranded London as this global city with you know, creativity and transparency and art and everything you need for an attractive investment climate. People like uh, Bruce Nauman uh, exhibited and, and Louise Bourgeois and highly political art such as Ai Weiwei, part of the Unilever series, funded, therefore, indirectly by Mibale, who you just saw. The last installment uh, was Tino Segal uh, with his rendition on changing labor conditions and, and how it impacts lives of people in London, I guess. So, of course, I'm not against this collusion between art and capital. We all inhabit it. We cannot go around it unless revolution breaks out. Uh, it seems it's not going to happen today. Um, not at this conference, maybe, either. Uh, but... I just would love this, say, this capital accumulation, not just economic, but also intellectual and emotional, etc., capital accumulation, to happen not just in this winning side of the global equation, but also in the other parts, in Congo, therefore. Um, so I invited Richard Florida. He only speak, spoke through Skype. You know Richard Florida. He's like the great uh, vanguard of creative capital. And therefore, in the art world, we all love to hate him because he takes art as something that is there just to you know, make business grow, not for real critical engagement. And of course, we are, and I am too, genuinely about critical engagement, not about art just as a means for business. And yet... In 2008, in the Netherlands, I think there are... How many communities do we have in the Netherlands? Hoeveel gemeentes? Maybe 300 or something? In 2008, in the 300 Dutch municipalities, all but two mentioned Richard Florida in their policy papers 
as to how to make their business and their economies and their creativity grow. Every single one of them, except for two out of the true 300. So I figured, look, I don't like the politics of Richard Florida, but who am I to judge that all Dutch communities can have his policies in how to attract capital through art, but people on the plantation should be denied that knowledge. So I made him the keynote speaker of this first conference that we had in 2012. Um, how can plantation workers live of art and feelings and critical engagement? Of course, many people in the art world really hate me for doing that. Maybe not you, but many do. I, I just received a mail by Adam Chimchek, who's doing the next documenta, that it's so yeah, problematic to, to have Richard Florida talk at an art event. And, and this is problematic too. I figured, so how will these people make money? Yeah? They produce cocoa. Biggest cocoa port in the world is in Amsterdam. They make $20 a month, that's for the entire family, right? It's not just for him, he has to feed his children and his wife and his grandmother, etc. And he can't live of it. And, and the extra value of the chocolate is made at these, at these publicity agents. That's where the extra value arises in the chocolate business. So I figured, well, maybe they should add feelings and emotions and critical thoughts to chocolate. So I, I discussed this at these conferences and we came up together the Congolese Plantation Workers Art League has been established in the meantime, and, and people started making self-portraits in clay out of the River Congo. And, and then we scanned, uh, yeah, self portraits So their face, their feelings, and these are just small ones, but really big ones, allegorical sculptures about art and capital and betrayal and hope and aspiration and death and disaster. So big sculptures may, and we scanned them, and then we uploaded them through a satellite to Amsterdam, printed them 3D, made molds, and made chocolate bars, really, but now with their feelings and emotions added to it. So this is a, a, a portrait of, of, uh, of Manenga, a self-portrait. Not uh, Mibale, whom you just saw, but one of his colleagues. He, he, he was just not talented enough, unfortunately. Um, so rather than the feelings of added by, let's say, Mars or Snickers or whatever chocolate brand, you have here, it's now the feelings of the people living on the plantation. It raises the income per gram of chocolate with 7,000%. So just to give you a reference, if you buy fair trade chocolate, the normal salary, the $20 per month salary, goes up with 20%. And if it's like fair chain, the entire chain is fair, then it goes up with, I don't know, 40%. So rather than making $20, he'll make $28 per month, which is, of course, still not something you could live off, but it's fair. Uh, here it's 7,000%, so it starts to work a tiny bit. This is a unique moment in history. For the very first time, we pay for the feelings of plantation workers. We have paid in the past for feelings and critical thoughts of artists reflecting about other people doing plantation labor. 12 Years a Slave is a fantastic film um, by Steve McQueen. But uh, here we pay it to the plantation workers because they have feelings and critical thoughts too. That's not surprising, I guess, but it's true. Of course, it's problematic because um, you can certainly argue that it's racist to have a black man reproduced in black chocolate, or if you eat it, it could make you into a cannibal. Um, and I agree with all of that. But I think it's sterile to pretend we don't do all of it. I think we can be so much more radical if we, if we somehow take into account how we are co-opted by and dependent on these inequalities and all the policies that run it, whether we know it or not, and start from there. Otherwise, we're just cleaning, sweeping the floor in front of ourselves and say, look, we're decolonized and we're inclusive and it's worthless. Yeah. So, okay, what is really great is that of these 7,000%, which again is you know, quite a lot, and we aim to sell uh, a lot of them, so yeah, go to the website, humanactivities.org. Um, some of that money goes into the research center on art and global inequality that we're building on that site. A tiny percentage, I should say, but it's of paramount importance, of course, that 
uh, Mibale and, uh, and, and, uh, and, and Mbuku Kipala and uh, Emery Muhanga, that they co-fund the center, because it's their center, really. Of course, it's not enough. So I think there are many Swedish officials of exhibition agencies. Please come to talk with me. It's very important for these types of events to help happen at the other end of the global equation. Uh, we need more money for that. Um, we're going to invite some of the people who are part of the Unilever series. Tomorrow, on Monday, I'm talking with Karsten Huller, who made these, funded by Unilever and therefore by Mibale, who made these huge uh, slides in Tate Modern. I don't know if you know about them. You could slide down them. It was fantastic. We want to build the very same thing on the plantation so that Mibale and his kids can slide down. And then we will really know what these slides mean, I think. Uh, Karsten is favorable to that idea, too. Um, Right, my time is up. Uh, I'll just make a final statement here. Um, why I think it is absolutely necessary, I think I made my point, to build a space for discussions about dissent and about discipline, not only in Malmo. Let's do it here, but let's make sure it happens elsewhere too, because that's the only way in which I think this is meaningful. Um, I'm very grateful that the plantation workers somehow found a way, because it was their idea, to co-fund the whole endeavor. So it's not charity, it's economic study of economic equality through self-representation. And finally, what is maybe the best part is that it really, after a while, if you hold it, but I've not been holding it long enough, it, the, the chocolate melts and it gives me dirty hands. Not yet, let's scratch. It's too cold here, Sweden. It, gives me, it would have given me dirty hands if I were in Congo. And that's probably the best part of the whole thing, that it would force me to have dirty hands and then lick the chocolate. It's sweet. Thank you.